and uh, we're going to continue. Uh, as you might, may remember, this is where uh, Paul and Barnabas meet the sorcerer Bar Jesus. Okay, and we've already kind of went over some types there and all that. We, we've uh, uh, continued down the road of studying unexpected spiritual conflict. And Paul and Barnabas, uh, their experience with that conflict. Now, um, these are just essentially a couple young guys going around sharing the good news. You know, helping people, right? And you would think when you're going around sharing good news, helping people, that you'd be welcomed with open arms. But the devil met them at the doorstep. Now, um... We looked at how they were sent by God with the Word of God, and now we're looking at the inevitable. Uh, they ran into those that rejected God. We started looking at that last week. Okay, That's inevitably going to happen with you as a Christian. That will inevitably happen with us as a church, and that is obviously happening with the body of Christ. Okay? So you're going to run into the same thing. And as you are sent by the Lord with the truth into the workplace, okay, you're going to go into your workplace with that truth, maybe in your neighborhood, maybe when we're door knocking, if the Lord opened that door and we can do that. Uh, how about your family around the dinner table? You're sent with the truth to your family, to the dinner table. What are you going to find? Well, you're going to run into those that reject God, aren't you? And that doesn't mean that you love them any less. You know, you may be looking at an aunt, an uncle, and they're rejecting God, just plainly. You still love them, but you can't falter on your decision on where you stand with the Word, right? And that was what Paul and Barnabas um, were dealing with. They weren't going to falter. Now, um, just because that you run into those that reject God, does that mean you just float downstream with them? No. You can't do that. You can't. Why? Because your relationship with the Lord is the most serious topic in your life. All right? Not even your spouse's. Yours. Not even your children's. Yours. You need to have that open phone line with the Lord. At all times. Now, as many churches and denominations as there are, uh, you can almost find just as many teachings about the Holy Ghost, right? And because what we're going to look at today is how they were filled with the Spirit of God. You can ask anybody, uh, what is it to be filled with the Holy Ghost? And probably as many people as you ask, you'll get a different answer. Okay? We know what the answers are. What is it? Well, you ask a Mormon, he'll say, well, there's a burning in the bosom, right? And I don't know if that's holy heartburn or what you want to call that. Um, but uh, you ask someone else, they'll say it's speaking in gibberish tongues. That's how you know if you're filled with the Holy Spirit. You speak uh, things that no one can understand, which we understand that 1 Corinthians 14 destroys that idea. Because I mean, look at Acts chapter 2. Everybody says, wow, they speak in my language, which means tongues is always a real language. Okay? Now, interesting enough in our text, we see something different. Uh, we see, uh, let's go to verse 4. And I know I'm kind of going to be bouncing around a little bit. But last week we looked at how those were fighting and rejecting the Spirit of God. This week we're going to look at those filled with the Spirit of God. In verse 4 it says, So they being sent forth by the what? By the Holy Ghost. There is no question that these men, Paul and Barnabas, were sent by the Holy Ghost. No question at all. There's, it's not even on the table. You cannot question that. It's a fact. They were sent by the Holy Ghost. Now, those that are uh, filled with the Spirit are going to have some characteristics, which we're going to find in chapter 13. The first characteristic I want to show you is in verse 4. They go where they are sent. 
Okay? People who are filled with the Holy Spirit go where they are sent. Okay? Now, press pause. Okay? Because just before you run off that cliff, I just want to tell you what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that a Christian always does Christian should. Why? Because if you were to take a sober look at yourself in the past 24 hours, come on, let's be honest, you have done things that you should not have. You have said things that you should not have. I mean, I was saying stuff to Steve and Linda this morning. I had to call and repent because I was already being uh, an idiot. <laughs> and I had to say, I'm sorry, guys. You know, it's before church and uh, I'm just flying around and I'm just trying to get here and I was nervous about meeting here and la, 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 la. But anyway, a Christian does not always do what they should. Underline that word should. In, uh, in Ephesians chapter 2, um, verse 8 and 9, and 10, it says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. Okay? Underline not of yourselves if, if it's not already underlined. It is the gift of God. Gifts are not earned, by the way. Verse 10, not of works, in case you didn't understand what a gift was. A gift is not of works. And it says, lest any man should boast. Okay? But don't stop there. We continue to verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk. You should walk in those good works. Guess what? You're probably not always going to, but you should. Because what people do with it, with maybe even with what I'm saying, that those filled with the Holy, Holy Spirit... Go where they are sent. That's best case scenario. You get what I'm saying? Because a lot, there, there are probably a lot of unreached people in this community because Christians who refuse to be filled with the Holy Spirit, they're not concerned with being filled with the Holy Spirit. They're not going way, where they're to be sent. Okay? Now, I believe in a local church I'm not a Baptist writer, but I believe in a local church that when God plants you in a locality, we should have a presence in that locality. We should be ministering to that locality. Okay? And I think a lot of times Bible believers are not able to get together because they don't know that there's other Bible believers in the community. Okay? Which I think for churches like ours has largely been a subject. They don't know we're here. They just don't know we're here. I mean, I, I, you would not believe... I run into people at the oddest places and they say, man, I just read the King James Bible. And I'm like, where have you been? And they're like, well, you do too? And we're looking at each other all confused because we didn't realize there was other people in this community that stick with the old paths. Amen? So it is part of our job to... I mean... As this stuff gets more illegal, okay, we're going to have to figure out different ways to do it. But we need to find each other, okay? And we need to find others that are like us. And they need to find us, all right? Anyway, so, but as a general statement, those who are filled with the Spirit of God go where they are sent, okay? Um, the fact is, Christians... We don't always do perfectly. Christians can do heinous things and ungodly things. Uh, uh, if you've been Christian for more than a year, you've probably met a Christian that's done some pretty heinous things. This place we meet, for instance, got things, uh, they're subject to theft because of other Christians. They essentially robbed them. They walked off the property with things that were not theirs. Christians. Okay? Now, um, all right. Um, so with that in mind, <laughs> Christians are not perfect. When you're dealing with other people, you need to realize you're not perfect either. And then deal out that grace that you would want should you be the offender next time. Okay? Uh, hold your finger there and go to Proverbs uh, chapter 20 and verse 6. And just, put, I'm not riding this thing all the way, all the way, but I, I believe this is good to look at. 
Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 6. And it says this in Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 6. Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness. Isn't that the fact? Isn't that the fact? But a faithful man who can find. So the thing is, you're always going to paint yourself better than your wife would explain. Okay? The one that cleans your dirty underwear. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Uh, yes. But being, well, I want to say it like this. It wasn't that funny, sis. Uh, I don't know why it got so funny right there. Okay. Okay, it's getting warm. But being filled with the Holy Spirit is a choice on your part. Okay? It's a choice on your part. When you are born again, John 3, 7, when you have been born again, you have access to all of the Holy Spirit that God has available. All of it. The usage of it is your fault. Okay? What I'm saying, I mean, let me just paint it real big. The same God of William Carey. Okay? Huge missionary, Baptist missionary to India. He reaches India. The same God that D.L. Moody, thousands upon thousands came you know, to salvation under his ministry. The same God of Charles Spurgeon. On and on and on. You serve that same God. You have access to the same Holy Spirit that they were using back then. I mean, we sit here in a church of like 10 people and we're looking around like, us? You guys. Okay? Now, as you read those biographies, it's very quick to see they used the, they used the Bible, they used the Scripture, they used the Holy Spirit a lot different than Christians are using it today. I mean, remember where we came into? We came into A.V. King James Baptist Church. First of all, they believed that the words of God were God's actual words. That's a very good starting point if you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Believe what you read, okay? Don't go run into the Greek to hide from the truth, okay? So... Um, it, it is a choice. You have availability to everything, and that's the same for every born-again Christian. You have availability to all of the Holy Spirit, okay? And you could be in a prison. Uh, you could be on top of a tower. You could be on Mount Everest. Uh, you could be in Death Valley, and you have all of the Holy Spirit available to you should you choose to use that. All right? Look at Ephesians chapter 5, and uh, we have a lot of Bible verses, so I'm going to try to kind of go through these here. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 17. It's just so weird to be in a place that we can finally open up a Bible without the wind blowing our Bibles all over the place. Thank you, Lord. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17 and 18. It says, Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Okay? Well, we need to understand what the will of the Lord is. Look at it. Be not drunk with wine. Okay? Okay. I'm not even bringing that up, but I think that's interesting. It says what the will of the Lord is. Bam, right there. Comma, where, where, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. You need to be filled with... The, that is the will of the Lord, for you to be filled with the Spirit. No question about it. So if you, if you walked into church this morning, and I, I feel like I'm probably, everyone in this room is probably guilty and you were not filled with the Spirit, it's not God's fault. It's not your preacher's fault either. It's not your husband's fault. It's not your wife's fault. It's your fault. It's not even your kid's fault. It's your fault. Because it's the will of the Lord for you. Okay? So, um, what I want to say about this, back in the, uh, Acts chapter 13, verse 4, these folks that were, uh, that were filled with the Spirit, I want to show you what the Spirit does with them. 
because he does something. See, spirits are spirits of influence wherever they come from. There's a spirit of influence in here right now. Hopefully it's a spirit of influence of righteousness and godliness. Amen. But unclean spirits are spirits of influence. Just like the Holy Spirit is a spirit of influence. It's trying to influence you to do something. Now, I want to show you in verse 4 that the Spirit sends forth. The Holy Spirit will send you forth. Okay, look. It says, so they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost. You don't even have to pick that apart. It just tells you. They were sent forth by the Holy Ghost. If you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you will be sent forth to do something. It should go without saying that God has something for you to do. You. Josiah. God has something for you to do. He's like, I'm not even for. Who's all this person in here? I'm not trying to put heat on anybody, but God has something for you to do. No matter what age, no matter what color your skin is, no matter what height, uh, no matter what width, <laughs> um, God has something for you to do. Maybe you say, well, I mean, man, I got all these problems. Perfect. You qualify. You probably more qualify, actually, with more problems. More inabilities. You probably more qualify. Why? Because God always chooses the weak things of this world to confound the wise. Amen. Now, he saved you to accomplish something for him, okay? Uh, but the normal way of identifying is the same way they hire people at the grocery store. That's just how our minds work, right? We say, uh, <laughs> do you have a resume? Uh, yeah, yeah, I got a resume. And Okay, uh, can you list me your qualifications? Uh, sure, and your, your experience. I, I need, you know, your experience. Uh, you know, I, I've, seen, uh, I've seen deacons of a church uh, interview a guy uh, that was uh, candidating for pastor. And they said, can you send us your ministerial qualifications? And you, you know what the guy ended up saying to the deacons? He said, look, man, I can't force you guys to submit. And I didn't understand all that back then. That, that was about almost eight years ago. I didn't understand it, but I understand it now. I understand it now. Why? Think about this. You walk up to Noah. Okay? You're like, hmm. hello, Noah. We're thinking about you possibly pastoring our church. Uh, can you give me your list of uh, ministerial qualifications? Think about God, all right? God's like, look, I need a boat built. You think he set everybody up on the world and said, look, who has the best boat building skills? They're like, what's a boat? Well, because it's going to rain and there's going to be a flood. What's rain? What's the point? Noah was underqualified in the boat building business. Okay? And you know what? There would be folks that would come in here and say, you know what? Your pastor's underqualified, which he probably is. You know what? These members here, they're unqualified, which they probably are. But we're meeting and I believe God's getting glory. Amen. Because we're not depending on our qualifications, all right? We're depending on the Lord. Once you get leaning too much on your qualifications and criterias and all that, uh, you chase the Holy Spirit right out the door. Moses, um, by the way, was not a qualified speaker or military leader. Uh, hold your finger there. Go to Exodus 4. Let's look at that. Uh, yes, we're looking for somebody to uh, lead all of Israel out of Egypt. Um, he needs to be a real winner. And uh, as the interview is going on, Exodus 4.10... You know, a lot of people lie in their interviews, too. They say, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm a, I'm a team player. You know, uh, you know, I just do anything that it takes. And about a week into the job, you realize they're not going to do anything. They just want to get a paycheck. They're lazy. But look, uh, in, in Moses' uh, job interview in verse uh, Exodus 4.10, 
Uh, it says, And Moses said unto the Lord, Oh, I bet he said, Man, I can do this. I'm really the man for the job. Oh, you know, I'm, I'm just the bright and shining star of the workplace. What did he say? Oh, my Lord, I'm not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and, and of a slow tongue. Uh, Moses, that's not how you're supposed to talk in a job interview. We're really going to have to prep you. Uh, you know, maybe you want a tie, a suit jacket. Uh, you should comb your hair, you know, and really... Did Moses get the job? He got the job. He got the job. What does that show us? That God's ways are not your ways. See what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> I have a couple of illustrations. Like if, if I was God. If I was God for a day. You know, uh, I think the whole human race would be extinct within 48 hours. You know, if I was God, like every time someone would run the red light, the car would go, <laughs> you know, and any time the littlest thing happened, <laughs> everybody would just be, thank God I'm not God. <laughs> Amen. I couldn't even live under those rules that I would place if I was God, you know. But, you know, Moses wasn't, Moses wasn't qualified. Uh, what about Paul? Would he have been your first pick for an apostle to the Gentiles? Look at Philippians chapter 3, verse 5. Philippians chapter 3, verse 5. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 5. Now, you're looking for an apostle to the Gentiles, right? It should probably be somebody that can, uh, uh, you know, merge with the people. Kind of like understands what they're dealing with, understands their culture. Uh, look at Paul's, what, what Paul grew up with. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee. Oh, yeah, he's got a lot in common with these Gentiles. He's great. Uh, it doesn't sound like he has too much in common with them. Actually, look at Second Corinthians. Go to Second Corinthians chapter eleven. You know, yeah, maybe we misunderstood him there. What he was saying. Second Corinthians chapter eleven, in verse twenty-two, it says, uh, "Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more." In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. <laughs> it didn't seem like Paul really had too much in common with the Gentiles. Let me point this out to you. What was Paul's practice when he'd first come to a town? To go to the most heathen area? Or what? The synagogues. Paul had a heart for the people in the synagogues. And God said, no. Nope. You're too qualified. Now, personal, I mean, you guys, I think if we can probably go around in a circle here and say, what were you best at when you were in the world? And how has God used that now in your Christian life? And I think we'd, we'd all look back and be like, hey, I guess he really hasn't used that at all. With me, my thing was music. I was like, oh, man. I'm going to be a youth preacher and I'm going to have a ministry going to the shows because those are my people. And God's like, eh, it doesn't sound like a good idea. You know too much about that. Not going to use you there. Why? That no flesh should glory in his presence. God looks at you and all your qualifications and says, well, good. I'm not going to use those, but good. I'm going to use the other things. I'm going to use the things that still need developing. Like what? Your ability to deal with different people. How about that? <laughs> Are you kind of short-fused sometimes? I know I'm not. Why is everyone laughing at me? <laughs> but that's where I'm going to use you, with where you need help. You don't got much patience? That's where I'm going to use you. Amen. 
So I don't think anyone here would argue that Paul and Moses were sent by God. I don't think anyone here would argue that. They were. Amen? Now, uh, you might be the best candidate. Uh, let, let me say it like this. You might not be the best candidate to lead someone to Christ. You might not be the best candidate to be a faithful church member. Maybe you've never been faithful at anything in your life. You might not be the best candidate to be a street preacher or even a good Christian, but God can still use you. See that? Now, and I, I mean, I, I, my life is what I know best. And I guess I'll put it in the words of my old youth pastor at Calvary Chapel. And Mary Chris is my witness. You know, out of all the people we thought would have done something with God, you were the last. And I was like, hmm. I've been chewing on that for years. Because it doesn't make sense to me. But it does with God. He doesn't want to choose you because your ability or your qualifications. He wants to choose you because your inabilities. Which means, should you be in a wheelchair? Should you need a cane? Should you just not be able to do what you used to do? Or maybe you're too young to know how to do anything. You qualify. <laughs> how big is your God? How big is your God? And that doesn't mean you're going to be some uh, uh, rich guy or something. But how big is your God? Yeah, you don't got all the money. You don't think God can do it though? God can still do something. God still wants to do something in your household. God still wants to do something in your town, in your city. God still wants to do something in America. God still wants to do something in this world. How big is your God? Now, I didn't say there was an end times revival coming. I didn't say that. But how big is your God? Now, the Spirit sends forth. That's without question. I mean, I could have done a list of probably 40 or 50 different people in the Bible that when God got on them, they were sent forth to do something. I didn't waste my time. You guys get that. But I want, I'd rather delineate on this subject. Look at Acts 13.4. Acts chapter 13, verse 4, our text. And it says, So they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, amen, we get that, departed. Wait, wait, wait. Departed? Yeah. Departed. When you get filled with the Holy Ghost, you are going to have to depart from some things. And you won't be a happy, spirit-filled Christian until you do. You need to depart from some things. So I'm going to call this one, we talked about the Spirit sends forth. I'm going to call this one the Spirit severs. The Spirit severs. And it says, uh, departed unto Seleucia and from then sailed to Cyprus. I mean, if Seleucia wasn't enough, get out of there now. Depart from there. Hey, I'm going to put you here and depart from there. Uh, oh, you landed here? Okay, depart from there. Okay, you landed here? Depart from there. Well, you seem like a Holy Spirit-filled vagabond. <laughs> that's not going to make you very popular. You know, someone that's not set up. You know, someone that doesn't have it all going for them, that just keeps moving around from place to place. You know, uh, like, what? wait, wait, where was your church a year ago? Wait, 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 where was your church a week ago? Where are you today? Oh, God can't, God's hand can't be on that. God's hand is wherever this book goes. And it's not wherever this book ain't. And if it is found wherever that book ain't, that's the exception to the rule. And that proves the rule. That's right. That's called Balaam's ass. Mm -hmm. I get it. I get it. Yeah, hey, there's exceptions to every rule. But that's not God's will. Now, let's move on. So, 
the Spirit severs. So we learn from our text that the Lord severs the follower. Some in here have left the Catholic Church. Amen. You were severed, weren't you? Uh, some in here, uh, maybe you left the charismatic movement. You were severed. Amen. The, the Spirit severs. Uh, others here maybe have left uh, drugs and immoral lifestyles. Maybe even fame. You were severed. Weren't you? Once that Spirit got in, that Spirit started like whittling. <laughs> you know, like whittling away at all your what? Successes. <laughs> at all your what? At, at everything that the world said. Oh man, I like that. And the Spirit started severing that stuff off and whittling you down just like John the Baptist. I must decrease. He must increase. Amen. Now, let us not forget that the Lord is a divider, is He not? The Lord is definitely a divider. Um, he's not going to bring in the thousand years of peace until He brings the dividing sword and the blood flowing in the valley of Megiddo to the horse's bridle. Amen. He will. Why? Because He's a divider. Matthew 10, 34 says, Think that... Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace. Underline that. I came not to send peace. So why is everyone just looking, oh, well, if there's peace in our church, then <laughs> maybe there doesn't need to be peace in our church. Maybe you don't need to get too comfortable where you're at. Maybe you don't need to get... Uh, you see what I'm saying? You know what a lot of churches do with that? They say, well, where, where there's peace, you know, uh, look, we just need to do whatever just keeps peace. Look, we need to have a music service for the young people. We need to have a music service for the old people. You know, we, we need to... We need, Brother Louie's calling me? We, we need to have... I'm going to... Uh, can't talk. Sorry about that. I don't have any friends, but Brother Louie, apparently. Um... But churches are saying, look, if, if just having a King James Bible is going to cause too much strife, oh, we need to bring in all their Bibles. Uh, Pastor Randy, you know, um, for those that don't ever bring a Bible to church, can we maybe uh, invest in a screen with a bouncing ball maybe? You know, just to make them more comfortable. Because yeah. we want to keep peace. Because if I point out to them, you didn't bring your Bible, they're not going to feel at peace. And what's Jesus say? Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Now what, what is a sword not for? <laughs> Cuddling with what is a sword not for? B brushing your hair? What is a sword not for? A manicure? A sword is to divide. A sword is to cut. To pierce. To slice. To hurt. Now, one characteristic of the followers of God that those who have been led by the Holy Spirit is, is that they leave something. If you have been following the Lord the way you should, you have left something. Amen? <laughs> A few Bible examples. Abraham left the Ur of the Chaldees. Abraham didn't have spiritual conflict until it was unexpected in the desert of Egypt. Only verses after the promise God gave him, and after he served the relationship, after he severed that relationship with everything he knew before. Genesis 12, 1 happened. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. Sever! <laughs> See that? Why? Because the Holy Spirit wants you to. Why? Because God loves you. Sever. Sever. Leave. Get out. Peter left fishing. Peter left a family business. I mean, you think about then, that was a death blow to his wife. He was a married pope. <laughs> he wasn't a pope, but he was married. Him leaving that family business, 
Brother Steve, can you talk to this brother? I, I apologize. Anyway, so... Peter left fishing in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 18. It says, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother. Just talk on it, Brother Steve. It's on. Casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. Verse 19, And he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. It says, And they straightway left their nets and followed him. How could Jesus ask them to leave the family business, sacrifice their family, their livelihoods? Because where the Holy Spirit goes, it severs. That was a mean thing God did. Or it was the best thing that ever happened to him in his life. Amen? Now Amos, if you remember Amos, he left off keeping the herds in the sycamore trees. That was all he knew. Everything Amos knew. God said, stop. Do something else. I don't even know how to appear right to city folks. I've just been living out in, in the sycamore fruit, man. Just herding cattle. Can't you just let them go the way they're going? I'll just go the way I'm... No, no, no. You stop and you go to them. If you want to turn over there, Amos chapter 7 and verse 14. And I I often reference this because it encourages me. Amos chapter 4 and verse... I'm sorry, Amos chapter 7 and verse 14. Amos chapter 4, ah, 7, and verse 14, sorry. It says, Then answered Amos and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son, but I was an herdsman, herdman, and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. And the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said unto me, Go, prophesy unto my people Israel, sever. Divide. Now, if you've followed the Holy Spirit, you've left something for God. Maybe you have. You've left something for God. Amen. And I'm glad that you have. I'm glad that you have left something for God. But maybe you've not left everything for God, you see? It's like the Pilgrim's Progress. I, I have kind of, in my mind, of like, you know, maybe I want to preach through that book when... when It'd take a long time, but the pilgrim kept having to leave off stuff. You know, and the life of a Christian is the life of a pilgrim. When you're first saved, you have a backpack the size of the, the, size of the world. Literally, the world. You got the world on your back. And you're saved. You're like, okay, God, where do I go? And he leads you to a narrower point. You got to let off a couple things now. Or else you cannot go further, pilgrim. So you leave off a couple things and you go a little further. Then you come to another point where your backpack won't fit again. That is the life of a Christian. You have to leave things off. And with that Holy Spirit leading you, He will lead you to those points where you must drop them. And the worst idea... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there is. Um, um, there's a leak in the back but he told me about it so that's just how it is welcome to your new building (laughs) amen all right Now, if you have left anything for God, amen, you have been rewarded with so much more. You don't believe that? If you have left anything for God, you have been rewarded with so much more. Think about this. What do you have in the world? (laughs) If it was anything like me, what led you to the toilet that night? 
puking, trying to puke yourself in the toilet, saying, God, don't kill me. What, what in the world was so good that led you to the toilet trying to puke yourself, calling out to God for his mercy? What was so good in the world? Oh, well, you had more comfort? Oh, you slept better at night, you say? I highly doubt it. With all the people you're wronging, hurting, harming. I don't think you slept better at night to tell you. I think you sleep better now with Christ in your heart. You know, where you can lay your head on the pillow and the room's no longer spinning, amen? And you can lay your head on your pillow and you know if you didn't wake up, you know where you'd go. Heaven. You sleep better now. If you've left anything for God, you've been rewarded with so much more. You've tasted the goodness of the Lord, and you cannot act like you never have. If, if you were to just throw in the towel today and go back to the world where you were, you would never enjoy yourself just the same. You couldn't enjoy yourself just the same ever again because you've tasted it. Now the Lord has repaid you and has yet to pay you with a home in heaven. If you understood all that you're going to get in heaven, you would never, never, never wonder if you got a raw deal with Jesus. Now, um, you're going to get heaven for all of eternity. You're going to get a new body with no more pain, suffering, no, no more weeping and never needing to tell your loved ones goodbye ever again. That's what you got in Christ. And guess what? You didn't deserve any of it. That's what you got. Better than you deserve. Amen. Philippians 3.8 says, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and ho he, mo, 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 my. No, no. And do count them but dung. There's an updated word for that. But it's funny, in the new Bibles, they never put it in. that I may win Christ. Now, these Holy Spirit-filled Christians, they go where they're sent. But they come when they're sent for also. When, God, when there's a person requesting them to come, they go. They go. Where do you get that? Acts 13. Go to Acts 13. Remember Sergius Paulus? Acts 13, verse 7. And it says that this man surges Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of the Lord. So what'd they say? Oh man, we're too tired. What'd they say? We don't got time, man. We're making tents. No? They didn't say that, did they? They went to go see him. They went to go see him. Now, hey, think about this. He was a deputy. Think about this, paranoid Christian in 2020. <laughs> Is he up to something? This dep a deputy wants to see me? Am I in trouble? He's a deputy. Uh, is he going to try to imprison us? Or They didn't get all paranoid. They went to go see him. He wanted to see him, so they said, let's go see him. Now they could have said, we traveled so far. You know what? They could have said, tomorrow. They could have said, next week. Right? They could have said, how about on our next church scheduled function? No. They went to go see him. Now, there are people in this town that want to hear the truth. Believe it or not. Believe it or not. And you could have lived out here for eons. And maybe you're like, man, they sure ain't around. They're here. There are people in this town that still want to hear the truth. There are still people getting saved today. People still get saved today. There are still people searching for the truth and you still have the answer for them. Jesus Christ. You have the answer. Well, Randy, I haven't led anyone to Christ, man, it seems like in 50 years. That doesn't mean you can't lead someone to Christ today. You can still lead someone to Christ because there's still people that want to get saved. There's still people that want to hear the truth like Sergius Paulus. He wasn't a majority in that area. 
He was a minority. I praise God when I got a phone call of a man that wanted to be saved. We talked for a while and he had come out of a cult. And he said, you know, I heard about your ministry through Gene Kim. And we started talking. And that man got saved right on the phone. And God punished him with helping me with my silkscreen company ever since. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, I praise God when a family showed up at church from out of town to see if we were even real. Man, they drove like two hours, man, to come visit this place. And they said, you know, we found you on, online, and it's just like we can't find a good church. You know, and, and, uh, and they've been coming ever since. You know, uh, I praise God when I entered into Wellsprings to be reunited with a couple that still cares about the old paths. And I praise God also the day I received an email from a girl. Of course, she left. This was my ace in the hole, man. So you guys have to tell her. I received an email from a girl asking me what my favorite book was, and I told her it was the Bible. I ended up marrying that girl. And she's been coming to church ever since. <laughs> you know, I, I praise God for uh, going out on the Christmas Boulevard and shouting it down and just thinking I was just causing some trouble. And then a brother, Kenneth, <laughs> comes to church and bless his heart, he has been enduring to the end. You know, there are still people out there that want to hear the truth. There are still people out there that want to be saved. There are still people out there that would even enjoy a church like this. Believe it or not. That's right. The one that uses the book with all the these and the thous. Oh, you guys still use that. Uh, what do you call that again? Uh, uh, Hyman book? Uh-huh. Yeah, we still use the Hyamna book. They can't even read it anymore. They don't even know what that means. Where's the drum set? <laughs> we don't have one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, are you guys uh, looking into working on that? Uh, yeah, yeah, we're working it out. <laughs> Amen. We're working it out of our hearts. We all spent too much time in that junk. Now we're asking God to clean our hearts. Amen. And put the right music in there. Um, I'm just... Go what time we got? Two? We started at 12.30. Does that mean I've been preaching for two hours? I don't think so. Um, what, how many pages I got? Oh, just three more. I'm going to have to cut this thing off. Let me... How about this? We'll finish this one point. Does this point finish? <laughs> there are people in your town that want to hear the truth. John 4, uh, verse 35. Say ye not that there are four months, and then cometh harvest? Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. That's what Jesus said. You don't believe that? I don't think you believe that. Christian. No, no, I read it. I believe, I'm a Bible believer. But here's the fact. We don't live like we believe that. We don't seek like we believe that. We're not out there in the public pumping the gas, getting groceries, doing the dollar store like we believe that. It's true. There are still people that want to get saved. Now, there's also people in your town that hate the truth. And we'll... I don't know why I always want to end on a negative point, but it's true. There are people in this town that hate what you're doing right now. Hate it. Despise it. These haters don't hate everything, though. They love things. They love some things. Sure they do. Uh, look at uh, 3 John, verse 9. They love some things.
3 John verse 9, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. You know, haters of the truth love the preeminence. I'm stupid. So I had to look at what that word meant. <laughs> There's a few times in the Bible, actually, I can't remember if there is pre. This might be the only time this is in the Bible, but what I got out of, no, Colossians 1, 17 and 18 talks about before all things in the beginning, the firstborn. That's what preeminence means. So if you love to have the preeminence, you love to be first. It's the me, my, gimme, gimme's. You got a big case of the me, my, gimme, gimme's today? Then you love to have the preeminence. You know, uh, if you preach and, and you can't, uh, 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 swallow the fact that I'm up here preaching, you love to have the preeminence. You know, as a Christian, even me as a pastor, I need to be trying to bring people higher than where I'm at. I need to be trying to equip the church people to surpass me. And then you guys equip people to surpass you. And guess what? We start getting this thing purified and start getting this thing better and better and more right and more right till we meet the Lord Jesus Christ. And the only way we can do that is not by having a worldly love of preeminence. They long and hunger, hunger after the special treatment and being esteemed of men. They cannot settle in their mind why one person would not be in agreement with them. You have a problem with people that disagree with you? Like, does it really eat you? Keep you up at night? And there's such an obsession uh, when there is an objection that they have a hard time allowing those to live who are in disagreement. We talked about that last week, remember? John Calvin, Geneva, Switzerland. He couldn't let a guy live that disagreed with him. What would possess him? Oh, interesting choice of words there, Randy. Mm -hmm. You know what John the Baptist's mistake was? John the Baptist's mistake was disagreeing with somebody. Now think about it. In all of Israel, one John the Baptist. And out of all of Israel, they couldn't deal with one man disagreeing with him. It says in Mark 6, uh, 25, I won't read the whole verse. I will that thou give me by and by in a charger the head of John the Baptist. Why? Just one guy? You can't deal with one person disagreeing with you? Why? Because you love to have the preeminence. That's why. Mm -hmm. You know what, what Daniel's mistake was? He disagreed with a group of, of men. And you know what? Out of all of Israel, and I guess you could throw in Babylon as well, out of the whole land, one person disagreed and they had to figure out how to throw him in a lion's den. <laughs> Oh, man. You know what else the haters of, of uh, the truth love? Because haters love things. They love this present world. They love this present world. In, uh, in 2 Timothy 4.10, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. You know, just like the Holy Spirit will make you depart from things. Amen? Notice that loving the world makes you depart as well. Demas started out with Paul. And then he grew fond of this present world. He grew a love for it. And it made him depart from the things of God. Now, this might be your unexpected spiritual conflict. That's what we're really looking at. You are going to get spiritual conflict. And when you get it, it more than likely 99.9% .9 will be unexpected. You're not going to get it. You're, at first, you're going to be like, where did that come from? Where the love of this world starts to creep into your heart. How did that get in there? I preach against that. Maybe you do. You know, I, I've helped people out of that. Maybe you have. And then all of a sudden, this unexpected thing starts to creep into your... How did that get there? It's spiritual conflict. 
John 15, 19, If you were of the world, the world would love his own. Uh, but because you're not... I'm, I got this out of order. Let me start over. Go back. 1 John 2, 15 and 16. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Right? Okay, so love in this present world, that should not be found in this place. That should not be found in this group of people. We should not love this present world. Okay? And it says in verse 16, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Now you can look at the three temptations that Jesus was given in the wilderness. And that's how He was tempted with all the things you're tempted with. Because all sin falls under one of those three things. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, or the pride of life. All sin. Because guess what? Jesus never had kids. So how would he, he know what it is to raise kids? He never had a wife. How would he know what, what it's like to bicker with a wife? He doesn't know. But all sin falls under those three things, and that's how Jesus met that criteria. That's how he uh, suffered the same suffering that you suffer. He understands what it is. But then... Back to John 15. If you're of the world, the world will love his own. But because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Why? Because you don't love this present world. You know when people are like, guess what? Guess what? Guess what? I got a scholarship to Berkeley. Berkeley. And, and you're not jumping for joy with them? They're like, what's the matter? How are you going to serve God at Berkeley? Well, let <laughs> Oh, get out of here. This is the best news of my life. Full ride to Berkeley. What's going to happen to your Christianity going there? <laughs> you're, you're just too extreme. Look at you. You can't even rejoice with me. Well, no, I don't believe it's good news. <laughs> what would you become to them? An enemy. An en they couldn't even rejoice with me for going to Berkeley. Yeah, you're going to go sit in class with naked people. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, bless God. No, 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 no. I can't rejoice with you. I'm sorry. How many hours have you studied your Bible? What, like five? Five hours in your whole life? And now you think that you're going to go to Berkeley and still stand for Christ? Sorry, buddy. You're not going to make it. You know, haters of the truth, they love something else too. <laughs> Oh, haters love a lot of things, just not the truth. What do they love? Well, in Matthew 23, they love the praises of men. Oh, they do. Matthew 23, 6 and 7 says, And love the uppermost rooms, have feasts, and the chief seats in the synagogues, and greetings in the markets. Oh, isn't that nice? Oh, hey, Father John. And to be called a man, Rabbi, Rabbi. Yeah, they, they love wearing Halloween costumes. <laughs> you know, everybody is not going to welcome you with open arms as you're trying to save them from hell. Which you have a hard, and I have a hard time too. I don't get that. You know, uh, uh, I heard Ruckman say, you know, sometimes a good comeback is, you know, I wouldn't be a good Christian if I didn't try to tell you, right? And sometimes those folks will say, well, no, I guess not. See? Because people are going to get mad at you, but I want you to know the devil and his children, are they're very close. They're very close. That's why you call it a tight-knit family. The devil and his children. And he doesn't much appreciate folks trying to steal his kids. Is that enough to stop you today? Oh, well, if I try to tell somebody about Christ, 
uh, somebody might get unhappy. Is that enough to stop you? Um, okay, I wanted to jump down here. We're going to skip some stuff. Are you willing to take the truth to those that want, uh, want it? Are you willing to take it to those that want it? 